Hey everyone, I booked a couple of nights ago at the Pine Creek Lodge. However, I found a journal in one of the drawers and after reading, I'm not sure if I should take it seriously. I feel like the police wouldn't take it seriously, but I feel uncomfortable. Maybe it's a sick prank. Anyway, here's what the entry reads. My eyes peeled open from a deep slumber, body rooted into the mattress. Expecting the embrace of morning sunshine, but I was surprised to find that there was no light at all. It was still pitch black. Staring blankly at the ceiling, my eyes strained, gradually revealing more detail and eventually reaching as far as the old wooden beams that ran across the single-story cabin. An owl hooted from a nearby tree. The cabin sat still, deep within the Pine Creek Forest, tall proud trees from miles of all shapes and ages, providing a sanctuary for those within and an eerie presence for those outside. It was bitterly cold. The fire had burnt itself out hours ago, and the cabin hadn't exactly been designed with energy efficiency in mind. The blanket was barely large enough to cover the single bed that sat against the wall of the bedroom. The bedroom was barely big enough for the bed, a wardrobe, a small rug, and the old wooden door half closed. Normally, I could see through the door into the hallway, but instead, I was blinded by an unavoidable darkness. As I lay there, I listened, expecting the monotonous and continuous stream of engines and exhaust combined with the muttering of voices from the sidewalk below and streetlights to burn through the curtains to prevent any true respite from light. But there was nothing, mostly silence. The only sound that my ears could attune to was the sound within the darkness that filled the void. The sound beyond the walls was a steady and gentle ambience, the wind occasionally howling as it wrapped itself around the timber frame, the rustling of the bushes, branches, and vegetation. There were creaks and groans as the trees bent to the elements. The air was filled with calm, a breath from the city. It's tranquil, but I'm filled with a feeling of isolation, the feeling of truly being alone. My only neighbors now are the nocturnal creatures that foraged on the other side of this wall. But why was I awake? I don't usually wake in the middle of the night. Did my mind suddenly come to the realization that I was miles from anywhere in an unfamiliar location? Was it so unrealistic to be processing the forest ambience around me that it had to wake me to confirm its existence? I continued to listen. But before my mind could settle in the not so far distance among the thick coverage of trees was a chorus of squarks. A flock of crows taking flight so fast that you could almost hear their panicked wings creating turbulence. What possibly had startled them? It was distant but not close enough to know that whatever caused it would likely be in the area. My mind did the opposite of settle. It scrambled to create a picture of what could have happened. The sound of the birds faded into the night. I lay there and listened for a little while longer. I pulled the blanket up closer to my chin, tucking any part of me under the comfort of the cover. Whatever had sent the birds into a frenzy is unaware of my existence. If I just lay still and quiet, it'll be none the wiser. My mind was creating a concoction of scenarios. What if it was moving towards the cabin? I mean, it must have been pretty big to send a whole flock of birds into flight like that, right? Maybe it's outside now. I snap out of it. I whispered, frustrated with myself. Focus on your breathing in and out, I told myself. I awoke for a second time. This time, to the light breaking through the curtains and dancing across the room. I rolled my head to look towards my half-closed, my, my fully-closed door. I could have sworn that it was only half-closed last night. Doors don't close themselves. 
However, it was dark beyond belief and my eyes hadn't had the chance to adapt to the lack of light. I probably just saw it as a half-closed door when in reality, it was fully closed. I dragged myself out of bed and left the woolly blanket strewn across it. I'll deal with that later. Today I wanted to visit the nearby town of Pine Creek. And by nearby I mean a mile and a half down a trail I can only assume was created to connect this cabin to the town. After eating lunch and spending a short amount of time preparing my backpack with water and various other supplies, I put on my chunky black and gray hiking boots that I had bought just days before I came out here. I haven't worn them and yet though, so this could be interesting. I slipped the bolt on the door to the side and gently put the handle down. The door swung open and I took in a deep breath. And greeted by an encore of songs from the forest of winged inhabitants, I inhaled the cold and fresh of forest air. An aroma of different vegetation that I had no idea the source of. To identify them, it didn't matter. I filled my lungs and could feel the now revitalizing air replace the toxic fumes of the city deep from within me. The sky was a somber gray and it provided a gloomy atmosphere. The cabin itself was situated in an opening in the trees. Out the front was a few meters of gravel intertwined with some small shrubs, which quickly narrowed into a trail that became engulfed by thick brush from the overreaching branches. Behind the cabin were more trees, same to the right. To the left was a dirt track that led outwards uphill towards for around half a mile. Eventually, it leads to an old rarely used road which I was dropped off at. It really was a pocket of isolated paradise. As I started on the trail, it quickly turned darker as the canopy above let thin stretching strips of light through. It wasn't overly dark, but I was noticeably more shaded. As I continued on to the sounds of birds communicating, I couldn't help but think about what had happened last night. However, I quickly tried to shake the thought, knowing that if I let my imagination take over, I would spoil the true beauty of the forest, staring me in the face with each step. I approached an opening after walking for around 35 minutes. It sloped down and the trees thinned. I could soon make out that I was walking down into a valley. If I stopped to look up, I could see a blanket of green on adjacent hills that encircled what I would assume is the town. A few minutes of descending and I could now make out an old mill that lay perched on the embankment of a small stream that now met and ran alongside the path. Eventually, more buildings came into sight. Ivy ran up the side of the once red brick and it was difficult to tell where the forest ended and the town began. And does anybody even still live here? I mean, they must do, right? Who are you? Came an old deep, cranky male voice from behind me. My mind muttered to itself. How on earth are you behind me? I barely stepped off the trail. I now turned to face this person and put on my friendliest face and proceeded to step towards them, closing the distance between us. As I moved closer, the features became more distinguishable, with long gray hair that hung below the ears a white beard to match and eyebrows that, while they weren't far off either. The sound of the stream elegantly rushing over these shallow rocks filled the silence and tiny waterfalls, creating a splashing as it flowed down the hill. The old man grunted out, You shouldn't be here. Sorry, I'm Ben. I'm renting the cabin about a mile up the... Oh, I know the cabin. I said you shouldn't be down here, grunted the old man. I was slightly taken aback by the comment, and my face soured into a frown. I took another moment to look back towards the town. Since I was abruptly sucked into this conversation, I hadn't had the time to really take in my surroundings. I peered down past the mill hoping to gather some more information, and as much as there were other buildings, something didn't sit right. From where I was, I could see the rear side of a row of houses to my left, 
and they all had one trouble in a but distinct feature. All the windows had a thick steel bars running vertically down them. Old rust covered bars, some bent, mostly straight, but without fail on every window were securely fastened bars. Whatever their purpose, it was stopping something from getting in. An uneasy feeling sank into the pit of my stomach. The sound of the stream only slightly remedying the fear that began to spread from my head down to my toes. I turned to carry on talking to the old guy, but he was gone. Meeting this strange character was unnerving, but it wasn't alarming, nor did it pose any immediate danger. I'm sure there are some nice people in this slightly worse for our town. I pushed on past the mill and over a small rickety bridge, as the stream took a left turn to run along the bank of a row of houses. I followed the track forward which led out to a dirty tarmac, infested with cracks. I looked right. The road wound into the trees but with no sign of anything but towering trees. I looked left. Houses lined the sides of the road as it bent around to the right and behind the looming sentinels of the forest, seemingly holding the secrets of this town's troubled past. The town was a ghost of its former self, a shadow of a once thriving community and engulfed by nature's own ecosystem. Running water was a distant sound as leaves gently rustled across the ground. Grass filled the gaps in the road as I continued cautiously, the wind carrying with it whispers of its forgotten past. I could almost feel the ghosts of its history watching me like a lost ear. I was being watched, only it wasn't ghosts. As I looked over to my right, I noticed a pair of eyes peering from behind the bars. The eyes followed me unwavering, tracking my every move. I glanced over, but afraid to make prolonged eye contact, I sheepishly moved on when I noticed on the left another set of spying eyes. The sun was now beginning its descent and the temperature dropped a few degrees. It became more apparent that my breath was clashing with the cold as the heat escaped through my mouth and nose. There was the occasional chime from doorfront ornaments and the crickets were getting louder. As I prepared myself for the return trip to the cabin, I heard a faint pitter-patter, a kind of faint tapping that grew louder with every second. Rain, I thought. I put my hand out, but nothing. The sound grew louder, becoming more distinguishable. It sounded like barefoot slapping against concrete. I swung around, heart pounding, completely unaware of what I might find. It was a woman in a white nightgown, with tears and rips and every other seam. She came bolting down the road towards me, dirty feet crashing against the floor, crushing the leaves underfoot. Her face filled with fear, her whole demeanor suggested that she only had minutes to spare. Her eyes fixated on the road ahead. I moved to the side, and as she ran past me, she shot me a glare. Time slowed for that moment as I made eye contact. A look that told me both to leave but also that she was no threat. Suddenly, there was a loud clanging. A church bell echoed through the streets, carrying on the wind its fading mellow tone. As it rang out a second time, I just stood there. Confusion and panic as shutters from every house began swinging shut. I looked towards the first pair of eyes that followed me the ones that had tracked my every move, the last one to close the shutters. We maintained the longest eye contact yet. Slam. I felt alone. My heart pounded against the inside of my chest. What did the bell signify and what was the woman running from? Why are the windows barred? I needed to get back immediately. I plucked up the courage to drag my feet into gear and I began a brisk walk in the direction which I came from. I hurried down the road looking for the turning on the right to take me back out past the old mill. I got as far as the two houses from the end when suddenly something had grabbed my arm pulling me so violently through a wooden door 
that I nearly crashed to the floor inside. The door slammed seconds later and the feeling of a finger pressed up against my lips had startled me. A voice whispered, Shh, before removing their finger. They don't know we're here. The voice ushered again. They'll be here soon. you never make it back in time. Who are they? I asked. You'll see soon enough. Quivered a shaken female voice. How do you know where I'm going? You said that I won't make it back. I wouldn't worry about us knowing. I would be more worried about whether they know. After finishing the sentence, the woman's face lit up from behind a candle lantern. She had long, messy blonde hair. It was covered in dirt and it was in need of a good comb. Her eyes twinkled in the light. It was hard to make out, but I caught glimpses of brown as the flames reflected off the glass and onto her face, which was small and delicately shaped and without any distinguishing features. She was wearing what looked like an old Victorian apron. It had a rip at the bottom and it was covered in marks and mud. Under the apron was a black dress that hung down to her ankles and beyond that bare feet. A sharp sudden gust of wind whipped against the front of the house, rattling the shutters which slammed into the metal bars. I could feel a cold shiver slither its way up my spine. I then started to notice that it was raining. At first, it was a gentle shower, but soon enough, the heavens had opened up and the downpour began. The sound of rain crashing on the ground outside as puddles swelled and water streamed off the rooftops like tiny rivers. A crack of thunder reverberated across the sky. Deep penetrating rumbles echoed through the very foundations of the town. I soon realized that I wasn't a prisoner here, but I was being kept an eye on. However, I got the feeling that it was for both of our benefits. Leaving now would likely jeopardize both of our safety, although I still wasn't quite sure why that was. I tried to take in my surroundings. It was eerily dark now and the light that earlier let itself in through the cracks and crevices was long gone. I was in some kind of hallway. The stairs straight ahead of me went directly up, and there was a door to my left and a door to my right. The floors are just wooden floorboards held down by nails that looked like they were ready to give up their job at any moment. Every step creaked and groaned. The shutters in both rooms either side were firmly closed. The temptation to peep beyond one was eating me away from the inside, but I resisted at the urge. I just wanted to see what was going on outside. Rain continued to fill the silence and the thunder would occasionally crackle and boom as the shockwaves bellowed into the void. Here they come. A loud whisper that almost broke voice said. Panic set in. Whatever was going on was about to happen. I didn't know what to do with myself. Do I hide? Am I safe if I'm in here? I had so many questions and no answers. The woman shuffled towards the front of the living room now, only a couple of feet from the shutters. Quickly dousing the candlelight, the features on her face turned to darkness. Shh, she repeated once more. Rain, the pitter-patter on the puddles, the leaves, the rubs. The tension was intensified as I strained to hear the sound of twigs snapping from somewhere in the trees. We both sat on the floor beneath the shutter, arms wrapped around our legs. More wood snapped in the trees. Another bellow of thunder rumbled and ran deep through my body. And then footsteps. There would be an occasional footstep and then nothing. Again, a footstep, this time splashing in a puddle only meters down the road. And then a thud. It came from above. Thumping. Whatever was on the roof was moving, scanning and assessing the best way inside. My heart was beating faster than I ever thought possible. If they couldn't hear me breathe, then maybe they could hear my heart pounding. My only company sat next to me, trembling with fear, 
fingers wrapped tightly over her mouth, creating a sound to prove seal. I did the same. The thumping continued. Something was up there still. A puddle splashed right outside the window. In between me and whatever was outside was a layer of brick into barred up window. A flash of lightning briefly illuminated up the sky and in turn, created a temporary outline of shapes formed from the window and projected onto the floor in front of us. The noise on the roof had stopped. And then there was a grunt followed by clicking. Not the kind of clicking that you would hear if you clicked your fingers, but a communicative click from the mouth that echoed across the air. Quick clicks, one after the other. My hand was pressed so tightly against my face that I wasn't sure that I would ever peel it off. In this moment, the city life had never seemed so appealing. The house creaked and groaned under the stress of the weather. The sound of clicking rang louder. It was clear that there were more than one of these things. Ringing. My heart throbbed at an alarming rate. Oh no, no, not now. The ringing continued. The woman across from me suddenly shuffled back, pushing herself across the floor with her hands, tucking herself into the corner, her eyes filled with terror. She was clearly distancing herself from me. I felt both petrified and incredibly guilty. This was not the time to finally get signal. I whipped my phone out of my pocket and without even checking who it was, I had to Klein, held down the power button, flipped it shut and then stuffed it back into my pocket. But it was too late. The sound of shrieks and the ominous echo of the clicking pulsated like sonar through my ears. A crashing sound from a room above shuddered through the wooden floorboards overhead. The woman next to me rose to her feet and grabbed a fire poker from the fireplace further along the wall. To my surprise, she ushered for me to follow her and to stay close. She began slowly shifting her weight from one foot to the next, deliberately dancing her way around boards that she knew would squeak. I followed, attempting to place my feet in the very same spots that she was. It was like navigating a minefield and I trusted as she knew where they were. Shutters rolled down my spine every time a crack of thunder or another wave of shrieks broke the silence. Rain still hammered against the roof and provided a shallow cover for the sound of creaks that leaked from the floorboards as we moved across the room. Once into the hallway, we shimmied our way up the stairs, hugging the wall and mentally preparing for a sudden fright. The stairs led to a hallway directly ahead where you can go left or right. The sound came from above us which meant that it was left at the top. There is no candlelight and you can barely see your hands in front of you. The air smelt musty and damp and every sound echoed against the empty, pictureless hallways. As I ran my hand along the wall for guidance, I pulled more flaking paint off. We reached an old wooden door that seemed to lead into the room that we needed to clear. Hands shaking and breath quivering, the woman in front put her hand on the handle, composing herself and raising the poker in the air with her right hand. We waited for any noise and when that was silence, she pulled the handle down and pushed the door open. Poker raised high, cocked back and ready to swing. We burst through and there was no going back. Much to my short-lived relief, I was still alive. I hadn't been jumped at or pounced on, nor was anything waiting inside. It was freezing cold, wind gusting in through the window, sweeping with it the rain as it soaked the floor. Visibility was still nearly nothing but, I could see a slither more as faint moonlight broke through the occasional thinning cloud. The noise that we heard was one of the shutters. It had been knocked off of its hinges by whatever was out there. Thankfully, the bars had done their job preventing anything from getting inside. Curiosity set in as I edged towards the window to peer outside. A flash of lightning illuminated the town and there it was, stood menacingly in the street below. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The lightning lit up the creature in a fleeting moment of clarity, 
and my heart dropped to the pit of my stomach. The large imposing body hunched over in a disturbingly familiar pose. Its large arms, long and built, with muscles supported the weight its legs could not. It moved on all fours across the ground. The body of a giant ape but with more human-like facial features. The wind blew the thick black hair that covered its body. Evolution had clearly strayed from the path of rational, sentient beings and created something that was never meant to be found. It was nature's own version of Frankenstein's monster. The way that it communicated in a more humanely way with clicks of the tongue made it only more unsettling. Another crack of thunder lashed across the sky, dissolving into a deep rumble. The feeling of fear paralyzing me, robbing me of my ability to make a rational decision. I didn't have to make that decision, as I was pulled to the floor by the woman next to me. In a state of panic, we left the room, navigated our way back through the dark halls, down the stairs and into the room that we were originally hiding in. It was now a waiting game. I hunched into a ball on the floor, embracing myself in a fetal position, hugging my legs and I closed my eyes and prayed that I would make it through the night. I awoke frozen, still in the same position that I had curled up in the night before. The sun was out and the storm had passed. Without hesitation, the shutters swung open and I instinctively put my arm up to shield myself from the blinding light that shone unapologetically through the window. I brought myself up to my feet as I gazed out at the sodden, slightly sorry for itself town. The ground outside was even muddier than before. It housed large puddles as they filled the broken road. For the first time, I heard the woman speak aloud. What is your name? She said looking blankly at me. My name's Ben, what's yours? I replied. I'm Anna, she said before tilting her head curiously to the side. Why have you come here, Ben? She said puzzled, almost insinuating that I would put myself through this intentionally. Well, I'm renting a cabin about a mile up the hill. When I first saw the ad, there was no mention of large primates that hunt people in the night. I said almost comically. She didn't smile. Instead, she pulled up an old dusty chair for me to sit on. I sat down and Anna leaned against the wall. After letting out a deep sigh, she began to tell her story. They've been here longer than any of us. They're smarter than we are, and they've evolved to hunt at night. In fact, I think they've grown rather fearful of the light. Once the sun begins to set, we make sure that everybody's inside. You've already heard the bell, that's when you want to make sure that you aren't out in the forest. We don't know where they go during the day and we certainly don't go looking. They are deeply connected to these lands and the trees that seed it. Many have come looking for them in the past and we make sure that they aren't found. There was something about the way she delivered that last sentence that didn't sit right. She moved over to the window and continued as she gazed on the road. That's why we are all still here. She said as she turned her head and glanced down at me in the corner of her eyes. Well, I appreciate your help last night and I'm sorry about your shutter upstairs. I can't help but feel like I put us in danger. We are all in danger. It's a part of our lives. You'll learn to adapt. She responded. Oh, I don't plan on sticking around long enough to adapt. I admire your courage, but I'm not cut out for this. I need to get back home. I don't mean the cabin either, I mean back to the city. Her head hung to the side, assessing the best way to deliver her following words. She knelt down to my level as I sat in the chair, a facial expression that suggested she shouldn't even have to say this, like it was simply a formality. Oh, you can't leave. You've seen too much. Suddenly, every ounce of trust, every feeling of comfort that I sought in this woman evaporated in that very moment. I sprung to my feet as I stepped back into a defensive position. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I was not staying. 
I slung my backpack over my shoulder and out of courtesy, I wished her well and I made for the door. To my surprise, it wasn't locked. I think I almost half expected some twisted version of many movies where there's no escape, but I was out. This was real life and I needed to leave the situation. The air was cool and the rain had left an aroma of fresh forest scents gently carrying through the air. You could almost forget that the forest is home to a nightmare come true. My boots scuffed against the ground as I quickly made my way back up the trail towards the cabin. I kept looking over my shoulder to see if I was being followed. Surely they just won't let me go that easily. It didn't matter what choice did I have. There was something unsettling about walking back along the path under the shrouded canopy, now being all the wiser to what was out there. My eyes flicked anxiously from side to side, trying to anticipate any surprises. Much to my relief, I made it back to the cabin. I quickly opened the door, closing it, immediately behind me and sliding the bolt. I threw my backpack onto the floor and sat at the table in the middle of the room. I needed to arrange to be picked up immediately. Maybe I call the police. Where's my phone? My stomach sank, a panic consumed me as I frantically searched every pocket. I whipped open my backpack and began by removing a few items. But lacking composure, I flipped the bag upside down and emptied the contents onto the table. It wasn't there. Anna must have taken it while I slept on the floor. My journal lay face down on the floor and so here I am. If for whatever reason you're reading this, then it's probably not in my possession. Please find me. I can't stay here.